Got a lot of questions uh, over the last couple hours. So what I want to do is I'd like to just throw out a couple more ideas and then just open it and Baxter and Paul and Tim can join me and we can kind of segue into the Q&A, but maybe we can start. If you have questions about some stuff, they can come up and help and we can make this more of a, a panel instead of um, frying John, okay? <laughs> Um, I mentioned the stained glass window, the idea that where uh, we see things, uh, I think clearly in, or more clearly in the Old Testament is what we call the compositional scenes, the scenes uh, where stitches, pieces have been stitched together, put together. And uh, literarily, that comes out this way, I was mentioning to Justin at lunch, that uh, every book of the Bible, including the New Testament books, they all have a structure. Baxter's been talking a lot about the structure, the way that, that John has organized the story that he's telling about Jesus. So there's a structure to, to every, every piece of literature in the Bible. And so what we're looking at is the composition. Now, for me as a photographer, I immediately relate to this. Because when I try to make a photo, composition to me is my greatest tool. That's where I'm able to express to you my vision. So for example, I live in Portland, Oregon, and, and the mountain that dominates the eastern horizon from Portland is Mount Hood. So it's the most photographed mountain by anybody who's a photographer in, in Oregon. Okay. Um, so there's a million photographs of it. Uh, so for me as a photographer, I want to be able to take an image of that mountain, which everybody has seen, but I want you to be able to see it from the perspective that I see it. So when I go to try and take a picture of that mountain, I compose it in a way that expresses me, expresses something about me and my artistic vision, uh, the way that I see it, and I'm doing it in a way so that you see it too. So I compose the picture. That is not unlike how people write literature. John didn't write John for sale. In other words, his goal in mind wasn't to sell books, which today, for, mo for a lot of people, that's their goal. That's what, that's what they're writing for. And they're writing for an audience or a demographic that's going to buy their book because they're trying to make a living. John wasn't trying to do that. So all of the writers compose, structure, arrange, whichever word you'd like to use, what they're writing. And one of the things that fascinated me, not only did the individual books have structure, but as I mentioned this morning, the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, the Hebrew version, has structure. It has an arrangement. And um, someone asked me earlier, like, okay, the arrangement that you're talking about is different than the arrangement of our, our Bibles. Yes, it is. It's very different. Why did we arrange our Bibles the way we did? And the best I can figure was the people who did that were librarians. So they just kind of categorized everything that was alike. So they put all the history in one place, all the poetry in one place, and all the prophecy in another. There you go. That's your Bible. But see, the way that the Hebrews organized their Bible, they did it theologically. Very different. And in this final shape, or at least what came to be the most predominant version of the final shape of the Hebrew Bible, um, the, the theology that has shaped it is specifically messianic. It's about the Messiah. They see the entire arc of the story, of the narrative. Not about a history of Israel, which is the way most people study the Old Testament. They see it as a story of the hope for the coming Messiah. All the New Testament writers pick up on this. I, I didn't mention earlier this morning, but if you look at the beginning of Luke, the way that Luke begins his narrative of the life of Jesus. 
he begins it with a bunch of people that he wants you to meet. And these people that you meet, one of them is called Zacharias. He's a priest. Um, there's Anna. There's Simeon. There's a bunch of people you meet at the beginning of Luke. And they're all waiting for this hope of Messiah. And when they see Jesus, they recognize Him. Unlike what Baxter was just talking about, what John says, he came to his own, they didn't recognize, they didn't receive. That's a general statement okay, of the world. These people did. So apparently they were reading their Bible in such a way that when Jesus shows up on the scene, they know who He is. Just read, read the first three or four chapters of Luke. And then after you get done Luke showing you all these people who recognize who Jesus is, the very next story he tells is when Jesus goes into the temple, opens up Isaiah, and reads Isaiah and says, he closes the scroll and says, today this has been fulfilled in your ears. I'm him. I'm the servant of Isaiah. Which the whole Jewish nation knew this is Messiah. They knew exactly what he was claiming. Exactly what he was saying. But they didn't buy it. They didn't believe it. Certainly the religious establishment did. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Sanhedrin, etc. So, what were they looking at? Were they just saying, well, there's metaphors, so we got to figure out what the metaphor stands for. Or are they all types? Like, this is a type of this, and so maybe it's this. I don't think so. I think they were actually reading it a certain way. And, I, and my suggestion is, I think they were reading it the way that the writers intended to, it to be written. To, excuse me, intended it to be read. So I want to show you that briefly. That's a like a five-year study. You realize that what I just said? That that's a five-year study. That's not. And I'm going to show you briefly in a few minutes this afternoon when you'd rather be eating dessert and falling asleep. So that's what we're going to do for a, for a few minutes. But um, the way I get there is two ways. Number one, I understand the Old Testament to be an understanding of an understanding of an event. So in other words, what you're reading the event that you're reading about has already been interpreted for you. And you're reading an interpretation of it. And now you're trying to come up with understanding that understanding of the event. So, I'll never know, at least right at this moment, what Eve understood Genesis 3.15 to mean. I have some ideas. But I have a lot better shot at understanding what Moses thinks Eve understands from, Mo from Genesis 3. If indeed Moses wrote Genesis 3. Are you following me? So when you're reading John, like when Baxter is referring to all these things in John, John, and, he, and John tells you this, this is why it's great, I'm not making this up. Um, you're reading John's interpretation of what took place. It's biased, it's prejudiced, it's from a particular point of view, and there's specific things he's trying to tell you. He's trying to show you. And so you're reading an interpreted event. So the first thing is, what I found early on in, in reading different Old Testament guys, um, is that, like, I, I don't. I wish I had a better illustration for you, but we're going to use the mic, and we're going to call the mic um, the crossing of the Red Sea. And most Old Testament scholars are over here, and they're staring at that event. And they're looking at it, and they're examining it, and they're doing this, and they're trying to look at all the details, and they're trying to figure out what's so important about them crossing the Red Sea. And I want to tap them on the shoulder and I want to say, you know, the answer is not in the event. The answer is in Moses' interpretation of the event. You follow me? So that's the first kind of assumption that I work from in terms of how I'm looking at the Old Testament, at least in its final shape as we have it today. 
The second one is the vast majority, remember I said there's these, the Hebrew Bible, there's three parts to it. There's the Torah, Moses' book, and then there's the prophets and the writings. And um, the vast majority of the prophets and the writings is commentary, explanation of Moses' book. Now this is blatant, and most Old Testament scholars will say this when they talk about what's called the former prophets. The, and they actually, sometimes they'll be called, if you ever pick up an Old Testament study book, which I'm sure is right there next to when you watch The Walking Dead. <laughs> so, um, I, I realize I'm talking to nobody here at this second, but just in case somebody does pick up an Old Testament research book or something, um, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, Samuel, Kings. Those books are referred to as the Deuteronomic Prophets because pretty much everyone has recognized that the way that they're viewing this period of history is through the lens of Deuteronomy. That's part of the book of Moses. Follow that? So that's pretty much understood. What I'm saying, it's not just those five. I'm saying the whole Testament is written, most of it, is not trying to give you new information. It's trying to explain what Moses said. Most of it is right there. And I'll show you a couple examples of that in just a second. Um, so the Pentateuch, that we call it, or the Torah, in my opinion, becomes crucial. So what you have in the Old Testament is what a, a one guy called... Um, conversation with an echo a conversation within the Old Testament where God says something and I'm, I'm, I'm not being literal here except if you're talking about the Ten Commandments that he imprints on the stone but there's something that God reveals someone writes it down someone else comments on it and they're having a conversation and then someone else comments on their comment so this is something that Paul and Baxter have heard me say many times. So here's the, here's the idea. Repetition without redundancy is interpretation. Let me say that again and I'll explain it. Repetition without redundancy is interpretation. So when you read something and then you see it again repeated, but it's not exactly the same, that means it's interpretation. It's commenting. It's trying to explain the statement. So it will pull words out of it, but change it a little bit because it's trying to explain it. If it was the exact same, it's simply a quote. So when you apply that to the New Testament, when you see all the New Testament writers quoting the Old Testament, there's two things, two major factors involved. Are they quoting it exactly, or are they trying to explain it? Most of the time, they're trying to explain it. But the second part is, what are they quoting? And this, this is where it gets really fun. See, there's multiple different versions of the Hebrew Bible. And then on top of that, there's the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible called the Septuagint. So for example, I remember I mentioned this morning that the writer of Hebrews quotes all these verses. He doesn't make any comment. He doesn't explain anything. He just simply quotes the verses and trying to prove to you that Jesus is the eternal Son, that He's God. As he's quoting, he's quoting <laughs> a Hebrew text and then in the middle of his quotes, he quotes the Septuagint, the Greek version, the Greek translation of the Hebrew text, and then he goes back to quoting Hebrew text. This is really unusual. Now, again, you're going, how would I know that? You wouldn't. But they did. They knew it. They could see it when in the scroll. They could see it when they were talking about it. We don't because we have we're removed from it. So I get that it's a little it's a little more obscure, it's a little bit more difficult to get at. So I understand that, and you can just drop that, let it go, and say, that was trivial information that I can use in trivial pursuit. 
if you ever have a theology section of trivial pursuit <laughs> of the Old Testament, which you don't, so let it go. The Torah, uh, I mentioned this briefly, and so let me just expand this a little bit. Um, there's a consistent pattern of the way this book is arranged, and the pattern is narrative, poetry, epilogue. Now, these are forms of literature. But this is a consistent pattern all the way from Genesis 1 to the end of Deuteronomy. Narrative, poetry, epilogue. Narrative, poetry, epilogue. In fact, you'll even see that pattern in Genesis 1 to 11. I think it's six times repeated. N narrative, poetry, epilogue. Narrative, poetry, epilogue. So someone's arranging something here in a way that can be remembered. And why is that important? You tell me, why is it important? Yeah, Paul said it, because there's no printing press. They all don't have Bibles. It's all oral. They're all listening. So the way that they would share these and pass these things along is to do it with memory tools. So the Hebrews use repetition, they use, Baxter's referred to chiasms, they use all kinds of things to help people remember because everything they're getting is orally. They're getting it by simply listening. This is why I think James says, um, don't just be listeners of the word, but be doers. In our culture, he would say, don't just be readers of the word, be doers. But back then, they didn't, they didn't have copies to read, folks. They're listening to someone else read a scroll. Jesus stands up, reads the scroll, puts the scroll back. He can't take it home and study it. You follow what I'm saying? That's, that's what's happening. So anyway, so there's these patterns. And, and part of the reason is a memory reason for people to be able to remember, to, to understand the stories. But there's also a what it seems to me to be a theological reason. These sections of narrative and poetry and epilogue, there's, there's four major poems in the Pentateuch. They occur at Genesis 49, Exodus 15, Numbers 22 through 24, and Deuteronomy 30. Those are the four major poems of the Pentateuch. And three of the four, Ex Exodus 15 is kind of, it's kind of a little bit of a weird bird. So I'm not going to get into it. But the other three all begin, the, po the poems begin with in the last days. That's what the poem's about, the last days. That, does that surprise anybody? Because I'm sure you're all sitting there thinking, wait a minute, I thought the Pentateuch was about the law. No, the poems are about the last days. They're not about the law. And the main figure of each poem is a king that would come. And this king would be the line of the tribe of Judah, according to Genesis 49. And there's other markers to identify him in Numbers and in Deuteronomy. This king is going to bring in a covenant... Here's the quote from Deuteronomy 30, that will be circumcised on your heart. This isn't New Covenant in Jeremiah 31. This is the covenant that Moses talks about in Deuteronomy. He's already talking about, when I die, you guys are going to go ballistic. You're going to go nuts. You're going to throw this all out and go your own way. I'm just kind of paraphrasing the end of Deuteronomy. But God knows that, and He's going to make a covenant, a relationship, intimacy with you that's written on your heart. That's the new covenant, folks. This is in the Pentateuch. This is in the Torah. Okay? This isn't some later date thing. This is, in the, be this is the beginning. So these poems feature the last days, a king that brings in a new covenant that delivers his people, and he's the son of David, and he defeats their enemies. And there's other things. The most important one is that this king is the seed of Abraham. It's in him, singular, that God is going to bless all the nations. 
It's right there in the From the get-go. So there's no plan B, there's always been a plan A, and there is no other plan. And Moses sees it. He lays it out. Now there's a lot of things he doesn't know. There's a lot of things I don't know. But he's, he's got some things that you're going, whoa, I didn't, I didn't think this was about this. We, we think about the law of Moses, and we confuse that with the laws in the book of Moses. Right? So, um, let, let's look at one real quick, if we could. If you have a Bible, you can turn to, uh, to Numbers. Let's look at Numbers. And in Numbers 23, and by the way, this poem is a pagan. <laughs> okay? Uh, his name's Balaam. And part of the poem comes out of the mouth of his his, an, his uh, donkey. <laughs> Which is really interesting. But um, in Numbers 23, uh, look at verse 21 and 22. And it says, no, no misfortune, I'm going to read this English version. It says, no misfortune is seen in Jacob, no misery observed in Israel. The Lord their God is with them, the shout of their king is among them, and God brought them out of Egypt. They have the strength of a wild ox. So now they're them, and Numbers 23 is clearly plural. It's clearly referring to the nation of Israel. But then in the poem in 24, if you flip over, in verse 8, Someone read for me verse 8. Anybody. Any translation. Doesn't matter. Okay. God brought them out of Egypt. Anybody have anything else? God brings him out of, him out of Egypt. He is for him like the horns of the wild ox. And which translation are you reading from? Did you hear it? Did you hear the difference? Say it again, Paul, loud. God brings him out of Egypt. He is for him like the horn of the wild ox. Okay? So you have a quote. You have repetition, but it's not redundant. The writer has changed something, and what he's changed is them to him. Plural to singular. And the singular is the king that he was referring about earlier. The king is going to lead them out of Egypt. This is called the New Exodus. And we could run off on that one in Old and New Testament. But he's done it right there in the poem. He goes on to say in Exodus 24, they devour hostile nations, they break their bones in pieces, with their arrows they pierce them. Verse 9, like a lion, he crouches and lies down like a lioness who dares to rouse him. This is a quote of Genesis 49. It's not a repetition, it's an explanation. Genesis 49 is a quote right after he says, this Messiah, this king that comes in the last days will be from the tribe of Judah. He'll be the lion from the tribe of Judah, like a lion who rouses him. You can go back to Genesis 49 and look at it. So the, the poem in Numbers is taking off the poem of Genesis and identifying that the king is not only the king that will deliver them, but the king is from the tribe of Judah, the line of David. Okay? Um, I think some of your Bibles say, and this is interesting too, um, it says Israel's king, this would be in verse 7 of Numbers 24, Israel's king will be greater than who? What does your Bible say? Agag. Anybody else have anything different? Anybody else have a footnote there? Does some Bibles have a footnote. Okay, Agag only appears in what's called the Masoretic text. It only appears in one text. All the other ones don't say Agag, they say Gog. Okay, now what that does is it throws this from, and so, you know, 
What it does is it throws it from an event that Israel knows about in its immediate future at this point to an event that will be way down the road. The Gog event happens in Ezekiel. It's way down the road. Okay, So you already have in different Hebrew translations an argument of how to understand the text. One believes that this is historically filled in, fulfilled in David. The other text believes, no, this is the Messiah that will do this in the last days. The argument's already begun of what this is about. And most of our English translations have followed the argument that it's all about the history of Israel. Hence, if you have an Old Testament class in most schools, Bible colleges or seminaries, the Old Testament is seen as a study of the history of Israel. I don't go that route. I think there's something else going on. I think it's about the Messiah. There are other places where the, the seed is identified as him, but I want you to see, uh, to me, where what sealed the deal for me is if you turn over to Psalm 72. In this psalm, I'll read the first verse so that you'll know who the psalm's talking about. Endow the king with your justice, O God, the royal son with your righteousness, for he will judge your people in righteousness, your afflicted ones he will judge with justice. So this psalm is about the king who also happens to be the royal son. Okay? Now what's important, there's a lot of things important about this, but I want you to drop your eye down a little bit further in the psalm, and he says in verse 17, May his name endure forever. This is the king. May it continue as long as the sun. All nations will be blessed through him, and they will call him blessed. Anybody know what that's a quote of? All nations will be blessed in him. What's that a quote of? The, the covenant, the promise to Abraham in Genesis 12. So the king has just been identified as the one through which the blessings of the nations will come. A singular king is how God will bless the nations. That's how the psalmist is interpreting Moses. Are you with me so far? Okay. So, in other words, what I'm saying is, I'm not making up this interpretation. The psalmist is interpreting Moses this way. Now, I realize there's an argument going on as to which interpretation is correct, but the psalmist is interpreting that the seed is the king from the tribe of Judah, the line of David, who's also the seed of Abraham. So if you flip over to Jeremiah chapter 4, you didn't know you were going to be flipping around in a Bible, did you? You thought this was a good conference. I'm, I'm sorry. That's just the Billy sarcasm. I'm sorry. That, Charles, thank you. So, J Jeremiah 4. I want you to see how Jeremiah is interpreting this. Verse 1. You will return, O Israel, return to me, declares the Lord, if you put your detestable idols out of my sight and no longer go astray. And if in truthful, just, and a righteous way you swear as surely as the Lord live, lives, then the nations will be blessed by Him, and in Him they will glory. There it is again. The Abrahamic promise in the singular who's the king that's going to bless the nations. That's how Jeremiah is reading Moses. So now I've got, a, I've got the guy who wrote Psalm 72, and I don't know who that is, but I've got a psalm that interprets Moses this way. I've got Jeremiah interpreting Moses this way. So I feel like I'm in pretty good company. Because that's this is what I mean how the Old Testament is this conversation with an echo. They're, these guys are interpreting what Moses said. And trying to explain that to us. Setting us up, leaving us, if I'm an Old Testament person, leaving us with the hope of the Messiah. So the ideal Israelite would have been someone like Simeon, or Zacharias, or Anna, from Luke 1, 2, and 3. Because they saw this. So when they met Jesus, they knew who he was. 
They knew he was the promised redeemer, the Messiah, the Son of God, God in the flesh, God who would be pierced for us. This is all in the Old Testament. Okay? All right. Next thing, and and then because I want to move, because I want to get them some questions, is I want to uh, I want to discuss just for a few moments the law in Moses, <clears throat> the laws, because this is I think this was a this was a domino for me. This is a this is a big one. Um, I mentioned that I think that at the very least, the image of God is telling us that God creates us for the potentiality of relationship, intimacy. That fleshes itself out to actually what in John 17 becomes, I, I want you to be in us. That's what's going to happen. You're going to be included in this relationship, the relationship of the Father, Son, and Spirit. But it starts, and it starts with baby steps. Because there's only so much we can learn. And actually, Justin and I were talking about this earlier, too, at lunchtime. Um, but I'm going to stop, because that's a rabbit trail. We come back to the law. The law has tripped us up tremendously. So much so that when we talk about the law of Moses, we typically, in our minds, think the laws. That that's what the Pentateuch is actually about. And I would, I'm going to suggest to you that the Pentateuch, the Torah, is teaching the life of faith. It's not teaching you to keep the law. Oh, God forbid, did, would Moses want you to keep the law? Because Moses says of himself, I'm a man without faith, that's why I can't go in the promised land. Israel's without faith, that's why they can't go in the promised land. But the hero of the story is Abraham. He's a man who has faith. So much so that Moses says in, in Genesis 26 that Abraham, even though he didn't have the law, he lived 430 years before the law of Moses, Moses says of him, he kept the law. Look it up, Genesis 26, 25. Abraham was seen as one who fulfilled the law. Not because he kept it because there was no law to keep. It was because he trusted Yahweh. And trust is at the core, it's the center of relationship. So Moses sees of himself and of Israel, our problem is we don't trust, we don't have relationship. Abraham does. But Abraham has to take baby steps too. And you can read all about that in the book of Genesis. Okay? So we get to the law, and if you if you look again, if you and I shouldn't say it that way. What I discovered when I looked at the Torah was that the structure of this book was intact and it seems like at the very last minute before it's going to go to press this giant bag of laws comes just catapulting out of the sky and lands on the Torah. And the Torah instead of being like this just goes like that. And you have this huge bag of laws. When in actuality, you have five bags of laws. Like when you open up the bag, bag, there's five bags. And the first laws that we get are in Exodus 20 at Mount Sinai. And these are the ones that we're the most familiar with. The Ten Commandments. And um, so here's where it gets really fun. If you have a Bible, look at Exodus 19. It gets really fun for me. Because this, this helped explain a lot of things to me. In Exodus 19, the people of Israel have been delivered from Egypt. He's led them out across the desert. And they've come to Sinai. And God's going to make a covenant with them. And in order to make the covenant, he wants the entire nation of Israel to come up on the mountain. That should be different from your story. Okay. But that's what he wants. He wants the entire nation of Israel to come up on the mountain, and he wants to make the nation a kingdom of priests. Now, what's significant about that? Well, what's significant about that is the priest is the one that has intimacy. The priest is the one that has access 
intimacy and relationship with God. Okay? And what God wants when they come to Sinai is He doesn't want a nation with priests. He wants a nation of priests. He wants everyone to have relationship. He wants everyone to have intimacy. And you go, well, where'd you get that? In verse 6. Exodus 19. I'll read verse 5. If you obey me fully and keep my covenant, my relationship, then out of all the nations you will be my treasured possession, although the whole earth is mine. You will be for me a kingdom of priests. There it is. Black and white. Even in your English Bible, there it is. Okay? God brings them to Sinai. He wants to make them a kingdom of priests. And they don't want to go up on the mountain. They see the thunder, they see the lightning, and they're scared to death, and they go, no way, and they send someone else to do it instead. The, we, we want a representative. We want priests, but we don't want to be a priest. We don't, we don't want to get close to that God. And again, if you go back to what Baxter was talking about, the blindness of the human race, beginning in, with Adam and Eve in the garden, what do they do? They run and they hide because they're scared to death of this God because they don't know Him. Well, Israel's doing the same thing. He brings them to the mountain for relationship, for intimacy, to make them priests, and they go, no way. We ain't going up. So they send someone else up. Now they become a nation with priests. And so God's, they say, we want laws. God says, okay, I'll give you laws. But if you look at the Ten Commandments, they're all relational. They're all relational. Like, this is how you get along with Paul. Don't steal from Paul. Don't lie to Paul. Don't sleep with his wife. They're all relational. Okay? Even the Sabbath law, I think, is relational. Because that links back to Genesis 1 and 2. Okay? We can get to that in the Q&A if you want. But... What God wants at the very beginning, even at the very beginning, He's going, well, okay, I'm, I'm going to give you how relationship works. But that's not good enough. Because then they sin. What happens? They build a calf, and they start worshiping it. This is the God that brought us out of Egypt. So right after that happens, God says, okay, back the truck up, and here comes this giant bag of laws. And He dumps it on them. Now, what I'm ta referring to here is the way that the Torah has been structured, the way it's been laid out. Every time Israel sins as a nation, whether it's the people or the priests, God's response to them is to give them laws. It's to dump laws. So it's kind of like this. God says, okay, I want you to come here. I, I want to meet you face to face. I want to be face to face. Because remember how he describes Moses coming up and meeting him? How was Moses described? As the one who met God face to face. That's what he wants to do with everybody. And they don't. And they say, we want priests, we want laws. God says, okay, I'll have that conversation. I'll give you the laws you want. It's not what I wanted to do, but I'll give them to you. It's going to take a lot longer going to be a mess, but I knew this, but we'll work it out. We'll get there. Just got to work it out. But see, God has to bring them and you and I to the point where he doesn't just say to you, I want relationship, and you go, even though you don't want it, we say, well, okay, that isn't going to work. He's got to get you to the place where you want relationship. So they want law. So God gives them law. So he's got to bring them to the place where they go, we're sick of law. We can't do this. Because what do they do in Exodus 20? They say, we'll do it. They're convinced that they can do it. God goes, okay, we'll have that conversation. The very next thing that happens is they build a golden calf. So he dumps more laws on them. Can you still do it? Yes, we can. We're not doing real good at it. But we can. Then the priest sin. Then he dumps all this priestly law. I mean, this is, this is the mode in which the writer of the Torah presents the laws to you. Okay? 
Every time they sin, we dump sloth. So my contention, and what I'm going to suggest to you, is that God never intended to give you one law. He intended for you to live in the freedom that they know and experience. That's what he saved you for, was to live in their freedom. And that doesn't involve laws. It involves love. But we didn't want that. We wanted law. So he said, okay, we'll go that route. And it took us about 1,600 years. And we still don't get it because most of the churches in this country are still trying to figure out how can we obey the law. Aren't they? But while the, the law is God's giving you that to just kind of tell you how to live. No, he's not. He's trying to tell you how not to live. You can't do this. This is about trusting me. This is about intimacy. And that you have no control over. You have no idea where it's going, but you can trust me. Because I'm good and I love you. This is about relationship. So here's the irony of all this. We as Christians go, hey, Christianity, it's different from everything else because it's all about relationship with God. And then we treat it like anything but. So, like... I'm suggesting to you that this has been there since the get-go. In the Pentateuch, the very beginning of, of the whole arc of the story. I think Paul sees it this way. I think Jeremiah sees it this way. If you flip back to Jeremiah again, just a couple chapters from where we were in Jeremiah 4, to Jeremiah 7, in verse 22, now this one is a translation issue, and... I don't know if anyone's translational will say this, so I haven't found an English one that does this yet. But here's what it says in English. For when I brought you, verse 22, for when I brought your forefathers out of Egypt and spoke to them, I did not just give them commands about burnt offerings and sacrifices, but I gave them this command, obey me, and I will be your God and you will be my people. Walk in my ways that I command you. Okay? That's not what it says. What it literally says is, but when I brought your forefathers out of Egypt and spoke to them, I brought them not to give them commandments about burnt offerings and sacrifices, but to give them this command, obey me and walk in my ways. That's literally what the Hebrew says. It's the opposite of what your English translation says. So what I'm saying, what I'm suggesting is, God never wanted sacrifice to begin with, he never wanted burnt offerings to begin with. He never wanted laws to tell you how to do them to begin with. That's what we wanted. So he said, okay, we'll go there. And we did. And we still are. But when we get to Peter, Peter says, oh, you're a royal priesthood. Holy. So he's finally getting us there, but we're still dragging our feet, kicking and screaming the whole time. What to me is wonderful about this is like, this idea of relationship being at the core of what God has created us for has been there from the beginning. This isn't a New Testament plan that I'm reading back into Moses. This is what Moses is actually trying to say. And I think Jeremiah, by saying it the way he did, is looking at this event and he's reading Moses. He said, this is the way I understand Moses to say this. To further that, I think that's the way Paul did it. If you look in Galatians 3, we won't turn there. Paul asks this question. He says, why then the law? In his discussion about all this, he asks the obvious question. Well, then why did God give the law? And here's his answer. Listen. It was added because of transgression. So I think, I think what Paul's doing there, and I know there's a lot of other things going on. I understand that. I understand some of the situation that's happening in Galatians, the things that Paul's speaking to. But when Paul says this, I think what he's doing is he's reading Moses a certain way, and he sees this pattern of Israel sins and God gives them law. So when someone says, well, then why did God do this? He said, it's not because God wants to give them law. It's because they keep sinning. And if they keep sinning, he just keeps binding them up because he's got to bring them to the place where they realize this will fail. 
Because it's not about law, it's about relationship. He can't just tell you that. He's got to bring you to that place. As George MacDonald said, God loves righteousness and hates iniquity. And his whole goal is to bring you and I to the place where we love righteousness and hate iniquity. Because right now, we love iniquity and hate righteousness. So, so it's not God's going to tell you to do the right thing and then you're going to try and do the right thing and hope that if you've done it enough times and you're 90% good at it, that God will let you in or that God will have a relationship to you or God will bless you. It's like, no, that's not what, that's not what this is about. What this is about is that I have created you and saved you for you to live in this circle. Us. To relate the way we relate. And we don't relate because we have to. We relate because we're free. We relate because we love each other. Everything we do is love is, is birthed out of love for the other. This is the way the father and son are. It's not just simply the way they do things. It's the way they are. And I've saved you and made you to be a part of this. Now, I can't do that against your will. I can't just simply tell you to do it because education is not the answer. Relationship is the answer. God can't educate you into the kingdom. He's got to relate you into the kingdom. Okay? So, this is what Baxter's talking about just in the last hour. He comes inside our darkness. He unites himself to us and in relationship walks with us so that we begin to experience His healing, His untwisting of our love of darkness. So that He brings us to the point where John, through Him, actually loves righteousness and hates iniquity. So no longer is heaven the utopia, but I still get what I want. And I don't have to change to get it. No, it is utopia in this sense that I live in the freedom of their light and love forever. That's the relationship. I used to think that John, that all that, you know, it says, he, he tells us to believe, like, I don't know, what is it, Baxter, 150 times? Some incredible number of times in his narrative. What? A lot. Okay? And I used to read believe, and I used to think that meant believe in the information or educational sense. Believe the right thing. Believe the right data. And the right data is believe Jesus. John never used it that way. Used it in the relational sense. Trust me. Trust me. Trust me. It's always been about relationship. From the moment he made you, from before he made you. It's always been about relationship. And what I'm suggesting to you is that the whole Old Testament, though it's old, and I know it's got a lot of problems in it, a lot of things that we scratch our heads and go, oh my gosh, what's going on there? What I'm saying, there's an overarching idea here. And it's the same idea of the New Testament. They just, there just isn't as much that they understand and know yet. And, like I mentioned this morning, the incarnation changes it radically. Changes it radically. Because this is what they've all been waiting for. Now it's here. Now it's happened. In time and space, in our history, it's happened. So... That's a little bit of my view. <laughs> so I want to stop there. And I want to thank, thank you. Um.